thoughts and criticisms about the content is probably the most important thing rather than focusing on the formalism of the presentation itself. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time. And actually, that's probably a good thing because during the cognitive science seminar, it seems like people are very free to <laughs> interrupt, and it happens quite a bit. So um, you know, that being said, um, so learning in Leiden, uh, we're going to cover the structure of this presentation. There's, there's basically three parts. The first part of it is a high-level description of what Leiden is. Okay. Uh, after the high-level description of what LIDA is, uh, we go into the different modules of LIDA at a very high level. You know, one slide per module, just to explain you know what these basic functionality, you know, the, the basic functionality of the module is. Finally, the the last section of the presentation, which hopefully will be the most substantive part of the presentation, the most time dedicated to it, uh, is about the learning mechanisms of LIDA and our conceptual commitments specifically related to learning. Uh, and in that section, I'll illustrate different kinds of learning, like procedural learning, attentional learning, sensory motor learning, these kinds of things, and give a little more detail about that. So, what is LIDA? So, LIDA stands for the Learning Intelligent Decision Agent. And there are certain um, this high level characterizations of LIDA that are important. You can probably say a billion things about LIDA, but here's a subset of those things that you could say. First off, LIDA is a conceptual model of minds. And I'll explain that in some detail about what minds mean as opposed to brains, because very important. We've gotten into trouble with confusion about this. LIDA is a systems level cognitive model. Systems level, I'll explain that in more detail as well. LIDA is biologically inspired. LIDA implements functional consciousness by implementing global workspace theory. And the concept of a cognitive cycle, which is the idea like a cognitive atom, is very crucial for understanding LIDA as well. And I'll explain all of these uh, in the next slides. So modeling minds. First off, minds are not brains. Minds are not linked to you know, a particular physical substrate that uh, you know, instantiate it. Minds can be realized, for example, in software, and that's one of the things that we're really uh, crucially interested in. By mind, mind means specifically, it's something that implements control structures for autonomous agents. And one of the critical things that, that uh, those control structures are trying to do is answer the question of what do I do next? What does this agent do next? And we're also particularly uh, interested in a particular class of agents called autonomous agents. And we have a very precise definition of autonomous agent from one of the papers that uh, uh, Dr. Franklin published back in the 1990s. So an autonomous agent and is, sure with that. and in our gracer, that's yeah. I probably should point that out because he'll be there probably. Yeah. <laughs> Stan and Gracer published back in the nineties. Um, an autonomous agent is a system situated in and part of an environment, which senses that environment, acts on it over time in accordance with its own agenda, so as it may affect what it senses in the future. So systems level cognitive model. You're going to have to mention that autonomous agents include humans, animals, and artificial agents. Yeah, I think throughout the presentation I need more examples in general. I think that's going to be something that's going to pop up again and again. Examples of. Okay, so LIDA is a systems level cognitive model. That means that LIDA is concerned with cognition end to end, everything from sensation to action. This uh, contrasts with a very specific component based cognitive model that might only consider one particular aspect of cognition. So a systems level cognitive model supplies a unifying framework, in other words, a theory that explains agent behavior, and the underlying cognitive processes that support agent behavior. Uh, another important point here is that LIDA is 
not only a systems level cognitive model, but it's also a systems level cognitive architecture. And the distinction is that a cognitive architecture also solves the, let's say, engineering problem of creating agents that uh, could then support uh, a number of things, including scientific discovery uh, through experimentation and whatnot. So not only does it specify something at the conceptual level, it also gives a path to the creation of agents. Um, as a motivating quote for why we might want to do systems level cognitive modeling, uh, there's this quote from Langley Laird and Rogers that I'm just going to read. Instead of carrying out micro studies that address only one issue at a time, we should attempt to unify many findings into a single theoretical framework, then proceed to test and refine that theory. So in other words, uh, if we don't consider things at a systems level, we're going to end up missing all the, the, the relevant details that glue together cognition, and in some respects, we're going to be selectively blind by particular components and never understand those interactions between the components. Light is also biologically inspired, meaning that we look at psychological literature, we look at neuroscientific discoveries, and we use that to fuel our model and, and how we make changes to the model. Um, here's just a, a subset of the different theories that we have modeled. I'm not going to go into all of them, but global workspace theory we're going to see more of because it's such a substantial portion of uh, the inspiration for LIDA. Uh, other things like perceptual symbol systems from Larry Barcelo, uh, uh, ideomotor theory from William James, uh, two streams have a hypothesis from Milner and Goodall. Uh, all these things have fueled and, and shaped the LIDA architecture. Global workspace theory deserves a little bit of additional attention just because of how important it's been for LIDA. So in this diagram you can see on the right, um, first off, global workspace theory, it considers mind as a collection of distributed specialized networks, which, is called, which are called processors in the terminology of global workspace theory. These processors, uh, which could be unconscious networks, they shape and constrain conscious contents and events. Uh, and these shapers, these unconscious networks, are called contexts. So you can see in the diagram on the right, the little purple dots are intended to depict the uh, unconscious networks. And the subset of those that are working to constrain the conscious contents, either by goal contexts, conceptual contexts, or perceptual contexts, uh, those things are all depicted into that ellipse there uh, under the context section, which influence the conscious contents. On the bottom portion of this diagram, the global workspace, this is the module of uh, global workspace theory that's responsible for consciousness, and um, its output is a conscious broadcast that then gets sent back broadcast to all of the unconscious specialized networks. Um, I think that's all we really need to say about global workspace theory. Um, but as we go along, um, some of these different concepts, it may become clear uh, where some of the inspiration and light it came from, from global workspace theory. Finally, in our high-level description of what LIDA is, the cognitive cycle is very important. The cognitive cycle can be broken down and understood in terms of three separate phases. The first of these phases, uh, called the perception and understanding phase, supports the agent's understanding of what's currently going on uh, in the environment, both internal and external environments. From that understanding, uh, we need to filter out the most salient portions of that current situation and the attention phase is responsible for doing that, determining what is the most important thing in that current situation. Once the most salient portions of the current situation are determined, those are broadcast, and from that broadcast, the final phase is supported, which is the action and learning phase. So from the learning phase, the conscious contents that are broadcast, each of our long-term modules can be updated from that conscious broadcast. And then from the action, part of the action and learning phase, the agent may then choose to uh, take an action and actually affect the environment in some way. So in some senses, a cognitive cycle 
can be considered a cognitive atom. And it's important to understand the cyclic nature of, of the cognitive cycle in that we have repeated uh, perception, understanding, followed by you know uh, action phases that happen again and again, and they can cascade as well, or they overlap. Um, one thing to understand is that for some of the tasks that a agent may want to do, some of the higher higher level cognitive processes, like deliberation, reasoning, and planning, one cognitive cycle may not be enough to achieve whatever the goal is of that particular uh, activity. So multiple cognitive cycles may be needed, and that is one important thing that we're trying to make headway on uh, in LIDA is understanding uh, how multiple cycles can coordinate to create uh, higher, le uh, higher level cognitive processes. Sean, yeah. need to say why we want to go from perception, understanding to attention, why the filtering is necessary. Okay, so to say that there's more in the current yes. situation that can be attended to at any given time. So, okay, yep. Uh, let's see. So that ends our section where we're talking about the high-level characteristics of LIDA. Um, I guess just to pause for a second, is there anything that you guys might have added had you been creating this presentation? Anything that is excessive? Um, I'm looking at the time and I think subtracting some, I think I probably spent about 10 minutes on that, which is probably maybe three minutes more than I really want to. Um, so I'll have to probably try to trim that down a little bit, but anything, any criticisms, any comments? I'm going to add them, where you got the cognitive cycle, you got the, you got the autonomous agent, the mind definition, you got the cognitive cycle, you got global workspace theory, you had all the theories and they are listed, that was nice. And then, I assume you're going to talk about the uh, uh, conscious learning hypothesis. Um, yep, that's and, the, the, it. Wouldn't the, hurt to the, mention that, like in one bullet, at that point to be expanded on later. But uh, I don't know. It doesn't need to be. I just yeah. Let, let's uh, once you've seen the whole thing, let's circle back and see structurally. Maybe there's a, a, a motivation to move some things out of the end and kind of move. No, I'm not talking about any, anything large. I'm just thinking about maybe. Mentioning it on Passant, oh. but, but, but okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I originally was doing was the conceptual commitments related to learning, which would have included the, the uh, conscious learning hypothesis. Okay. I had that at the beginning, and I moved it to the end, but you know, all of this stuff is fluid. If, if it seems to, to go better in the beginning. Uh, no, I don't think it, it needs to be. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things where there's that thing of the important you, things. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them sort of thing. It's just like one of those things you can mention at the beginning of like this. Will, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's just a just I'm consideration. Wondering. I'm not sure it needs to be in there. I wonder if either on this slide or on the global workspace theory slide, I can slip that in and say one of the reasons that functional consciousness is so important to light it into this discussion is that uh, LIDA has a commitment to learning only being the result of conscious or something like that. Yeah, the other thing that I, you kind of mentioned that, that global workspace was so important to, you know, more important than the other things, but, but LIDA really can be described as a computational model of global workspace theory. So I think it's even more important than you suggested. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if, if Stan would agree with that, but. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a computational model or, or concept. It's a fleshed out concept. It fleshes out conceptually as well as computationally some of global workspace theory, but and it models to what I think is the most important parts of global workspace theory, but it doesn't model all of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another place, if you, if you want to slip in the business about the conscious learning, hypothesis. conscious learning, you, uh, you can do that when you talk about when you've got the uh, cognitive cycle diagram up. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I want to talk about the broadcast right there. Yeah. Did you mention that the, the, the role, I don't think you mentioned the role that the broadcast plays in recruiting action selection and, and effective learning. Is that something that could be briefly yeah, mentioned? Yeah, specifically about that. Um, let's see, yeah, so role of conscious broadcast in I mean, there are many roles that are mentioned in, in, in those the work space so theory, but those are the ones yeah. that are key for our model. Okay, and how did you say that? Recruiting cool. action, what did you say? Uh, re recruiting resources for action selection. Resources yeah. for action selection. And, and affecting learning or? Yeah, modulating learning. Modulating. A term we often use. Modulating. It's not the good. Deciding what to learn and what not. Yeah, that's great. And yeah. then, and then, mentioning learning at the front end, just using the word a few times. <laughs> well, yeah, this whole presentation is on learning, so anytime yeah. I can sneak it in there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. But, but I, you're not going to get finished if we keep this up. Right. Right. Yeah. But I love the slides. Thank Beautiful. You. Very Appreciate nice. That. All right, so let me go on into the next section. So LIDA modules. Um, LIDA has a number of different modules. Uh, this diagram is probably the best way of getting a single schematic that explains or demonstrates all the different modules that are supported in LIDA and the interactions between them at a high level. Um, the color coding in this diagram, the blue indicates a long-term memory module, the tan color is a short-term memory module, and you can see different arrows in between them where some of them are orange and those are part of the conscious broadcast and support learning. We're going to go through a good subsection of these different modules at a high level to explain how they support light up, and that's um, you know, sort of the, the contents of this middle section of the presentation. Uh, as I go along, I'm going to explain which of these modules support the different phases of the cognitive cycle. Transient episodic memory is long term? I guess it is. Isn't that kind of a weird one because the duration is within hours to at most a day or so, right? That's so long term on the scale of yeah. cognitive cycles. Yeah, it's just, long yeah, there's different degrees of, yeah. No, it's long -term. Okay, so the first module that we're going to talk about is sensory memory. Sensory memory is the interface between the environment, and that's the, either the internal or external environment. Internal environment might be like signals from your stomach that are indicating hunger. Uh, external environment might be things that you're seeing in this room. So the sensory memory, that's the first landing spot of the, the sensory stimuli that comes into the agent. And uh, what it does is so it, it will take and encode this incoming sensory stimuli as a short-lived representation. Um, and it's important to understand that sensory memory is very modality specific. So you might have different implementations of sensory memory or representations within sensory memory for visual modalities, auditory modalities, tactile modalities, all these different things. It's really dependent upon the kinds of sensors your agent has, as well as the domain the agent finds itself in. So as we've mentioned before, software, we're very interested in software, and your agent may very well live inside of a complete virtual world. It might be a text-based world, who knows what it might be. Uh, sensory memory deals with that intersection or that interface between um, the external or internal environments and the agent itself. Uh, one important thing to point out about the functionality of sensory memory is the output of sensory memory. Uh, and there's two different things that sensory memory affects in the agent. One, there's a set of primitive feature detectors, which are little algorithms that run and look for important details in that incoming uh, sensory stimuli and will activate various structures based upon it. That activation is done in the recognition memory module which will be discussed later called Perceptual Associated Memory, or PAM for short. Also, these modality-specific representations are integrated directly into the pre-conscious workspace 
and, and form part of what is called the perceptual scene that supports the agent's current situational understanding. So this is a, a quick example to give an idea of how the, the data structures might reflect modality specific concerns. Um, one of the uh, things that we've fleshed out a little bit in our, uh, in our light of literature is related to the visual modality, in particular what we've called the sensory scene. The sensory scene is a uh, topographically organized structure, meaning that each one of the layers in this structure continues to reflect the spatial layout of the original stimulus that, that um, inspired the representation. Uh, the layers um, going from the lower levels to the, the top, top levels can uh, support a continually refined view of the scene, where at the very bottom of the scene you have raw pixel information. So this, if you're dealing with, say, a robot that has a camera sensor, you might get pixel information that's reflected at this, this bottom level. Then as you move up, along this sensory scene, you might get information that corresponds to color sensors like red, green, blue, uh, sensors that are active or um, features that are activated based upon the presence of different colors. Um, you might also have another layer that responds to motion in a particular location from the pixel layer and encodes whether motion is occurring. Finally, you might need to be able to segment different portions of that scene so that you can try to figure out which objects or which different areas of the pixel layer might correspond to objects. So don't worry about the details too much of this, uh, but this is just used to illustrate uh, one particular case where we could have implemented representations for uh, a particular modality. Each modality will be different. Perceptual association memory, as we mentioned before, is recognition memory. And what that recognition is, recognition of, is concepts and the relationships between those concepts. Um, sensory memory, as we mentioned, can activate some of these um, concepts and the relationships between the concepts. Also, within perceptual associated memory, activation could pass between the different concepts. Um, as a result of that passing activation, um, concepts that reach some certain threshold of activation will then move into the pre-conscious workspace, which we'll discuss in a second, and become what we call percepts. Just to give an idea, a conceptual idea uh, of what these concepts or relationships between the concepts uh, might uh, entail, at the bottom you can see this node and link uh, structure where what this is encoding is my particular car, which is the node at the top of this structure, is understood by its relationship with other um, structures, other concepts. So in this case, my car is a car, so it's a type of car. My car has a particular color, which is blue. It has a particular make, which is a Honda, and it has a particular model, which is a Civic. One thing to understand is that the links themselves also correspond to concepts, and so each one of those gray nodes on the link also is a concept, which may have other links to other things to give it under you know to make it understandable uh, by the system. Uh, a final note is that uh, in LIDA we do have a uh, a commitment to have grounded representations. So all of these different concepts would ultimately be grounded in some sensory experience. To give it meaning. The preconscious workspace. So the preconscious workspace is a scratch pad for preconscious representations. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, in our terminology, uh, LIDA makes a distinction between two different kinds of unconscious processes. One is a preconscious uh, representation that has the potential of becoming conscious at some point but it currently is, is unconscious, and that's what we're talking about with the preconscious workspace. LIDA also has never conscious representations. In these cases, there's no way the representation could ever become conscious to the agent. It is always just supporting some unconscious process. The preconscious workspace is both short-term, 
meaning that the representations decay quickly, and also it's high capacity, which means that there really is no conceptual limit on the number of representations that could exist in the pre-conscious workspace. Because of this, it's important to understand that the pre-conscious workspace is not the same thing as working memory for two reasons. Uh, and when I say working memory, I mean working memory as defined by Badley and Hitch. So working memory is first off considered to be related specifically to conscious, consciously accessible representations, which these are pre-conscious representations. So that's the first divergence from working memory. The second divergence is that working memory is considered to be a small capacity uh, module. Um, and the pre-conscious workspace is not a small capacity module. It's potentially limitless in the number of representations that it could have activated at any given time. So keep that in mind. The pre-conscious workspace, um, we have papers that were written on this in the early 2000s about how LIDA uh, can be seen as implementing working memory, but the pre-conscious workspace is not equivalent to working memory. It only supports the processes that underlie working memory. Finally, to understand the pre-conscious workspace, it is really a fusion of both real and virtual cognitive content. By real cognitive content, we mean cognitive content that's coming directly from either the internal or internal, external or internal environments. Virtual cognitive content is related to the memories, imaginings, plannings, other things that are internally generated by the agent in support of perhaps some other high, higher level cognitive process. So here we see the pre-conscious workspace. There are two sub-modules in the pre-conscious workspace. The current situational model, which is the set of representations underlying the agent's current understanding of its situation. And the conscious contents cue, which is critical for understanding time-related concepts. So to understand how these things fit together that we've talked about and some of the things that are coming, um, first off, understand that, as we've said before, sensory memory has representations that are coming directly into the current situational model. And this is sensory content. Also, long-term memory modules can be cued from the current situational model and memories can be uh, inserted into the current situational model through this cueing process. Also, we have processes that will be explained in a second called structure building codelets that have the ability to create new associations or new imaginings, new plans. They can discover new relationships between different content. And so, in that way, support what we consider pre-conscious thoughts in some ways. Finally, and I've talked about the conscious contents queue in terms of time representations, we haven't introduced the global workspace yet, but the, to understand the conscious contents key, you really need to understand the global workspace, which we'll explain in a second. But right now, just realize the global workspace, just as we've talked about with global workspace theory, is responsible for determining what becomes conscious. And the end result of that process is called the conscious broadcast. The conscious broadcast is saved in the conscious contents queue for some certain amount of time. And over time, you'll build up some subset of uh, the, the conscious broadcasts that have been uh, recently um, broadcast. This conscious contents queue can be used by the structure building codelets for determining time sensitive relationships that, between different broadcasts, and this might be useful for determining things like causality. The codelets, and we've already introduced structure building codelets. There are two different flavors. Uh, codelets overall are just special purpose processes, but you have one group of these special purpose process processes that are creative processes, and they might create or modify content within the current situational model to give different uh, understanding of new relationships, or they might support categorization, things that require looking at different conscious content and looking at how these, two, these two different things relate and then indicating it in a new structure. Attention codelets, these are saliency detectors. They're really responsible for trying to figure out which of the content in the current situational model is important to the agent. 
where importance could be driven by many different things, um, but just, just an intuitive example, we might have importance where uh, something that is really loud is important because from an evolutionary perspective, we may have learned that loud means that, oh, something is coming at you, or you know, maybe something that is bright is, is important, uh, or maybe newness is somehow important. Um, all these different things, um, the attention codelets are looking for particular concerns, and they're advocates for whatever those concerns are, uh, and they're crucial for uh, bringing uh, content to consciousness in conjunction with the global workspace. So, yes? I've often made this point strongly that importance was only one of the things that go into saliency. So I think that's yeah. Uh, I think that maybe talking about it this way may may confuse that. But you and I can talk about this. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe um, see importance comes about. You've got importance. You've got urgency, for example. You mm -hmm. you've got insistency. Yeah. You, you've got all these things that contribute to failure. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I was thinking more in terms of like um, a general this understanding of this is something that's relevant, or I think I was throwing that around a little bit loosely, but I think that's a good thing to, to, to clarify. And they're all binary 13. <laughs> it's my lucky it number. Deliberate. Yeah, I did it for you. Okay. So I'm showing 30 minutes in now. Okay, so declarative memory. Declarative memory is long-term memory for auto autobiographical events, which we call episodes. Um, these autobiographical events, or the, so the memories that are stored in declarative memory also include semantic memories, which are no longer episodes in the same way in that they've lost some of their context. They've lost their place context, their time context, emotional content. They become stripped of all of those things, and all that's left of them is the bare facts and rules. Um, so one of the interesting aspects of declarative memory compo uh, compared to other long-term memory modules is that the learning process of how declarative memories are stored requires the support of an additional module called transepisodic memory. Um, and also, the learning of declarative memories happens offline rather than online, which is an important distinction between other uh, memory modules. So we're going to go more into more detail about the trans and episodic memory module, but just understand that there is this relationship between these two modules.